Okay, I think we are set. Okay, great. Are there any announcements before we start, Marty? I don't think so. Um, the only thing is next week will be a little bit different. It's a little bit of a surprise, but I won't tell you guys anything about it until <laughs> Friday. So. All right, so that'll that's our teaser for next week. Hey, there you go. Well, hello, uh, welcome to Friday Chalk Talk. I'm Ruth Payne, a chaplain with Aurora St. Luke's Medical Center, and I will be your moderator today. Today's presenter is Sarah Stouter, who works in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Her talk will be an introduction to the specialty of physical medicine and rehabilitation, focusing specifically on cancer rehab and neuro, neuro rehab. Something you might be learning for the first time about Sarah is that her family believes that her great, great aunt or aunt, depending on your pronunciation, is the oldest person currently in Wisconsin at the age of 110. Wow. So uh, today we're gonna begin with Sarah's presentation, which will go for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open up for discussion. So please remain muted during the PowerPoint, and then afterwards we'll instruct you to unmute or you can put your questions in the chat. Sarah, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Marty, um, and everyone for being here today. Um, my talk entitled uh, Fazaya What is um, about the field of physiatry, um, which is another word for physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, and so we will uh, get started. Um, I am um, a Wisconsin born and bred um, person. I uh, went to medical school here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, did my residency in PM&R, um, also at MCW, and then did my fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine at um, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And so um, here we go. So we're going to um, introduce the specialty of PM&R. Um, how can PM&R help you as palliative care providers? Um, and then we will reflect on the correlation of function and quality of life. So what is PM and R? So this stands for physical medicine and rehabilitation, um, which is one of the specialties of medicine that medical students can go into and complete um, their residency training. Um, the first part, physical medicine, um, refers to the musculoskeletal system. Um, we consider ourselves um, experts of the musculoskeletal system. Um, back in the 30s, when this term um, was coined, um, it included things like physical agents such as hydrotherapy and hyperbaric oxygen. However, that's not really a part of um, our field so much today. Um, the rehabilitation piece was um, basically something that emerged after World War II as soldiers were coming back from the war injured um, with um, a lot of musculoskeletal injuries and brain injuries. And so this field was developed to enhance their function after that. And so we focus on um, rehabbing um, basically the neuromuscular system and also optimizing function with um, what remains with different adaptive techniques. So um, most of us are familiar probably with the three rehab disciplines um, that therapists um, help us with. The first would be physical therapy, focusing on mobility, um, focusing on basically the lower half of the body usually, um, gait aids and whatnot. And then the occupational therapists focus on activities of daily living. So you can kind of think of all the things that you and I do basically after waking up in the morning, getting out of bed, getting dressed, bathing, grooming, all that kind of stuff that we take for granted. 
And then also the instrumental activities of daily living. And this is um, a little bit more of the cognitive piece of things we do every day. Things like cooking, cleaning, managing bills, again, things that are part of our everyday life. Then um, SLP, which stands for speech language pathologists. Um, these therapists focus on basically three different domains. Speech, of course, um, working with folks who have any type of aphasia or, definite, or difficulty um, verbalizing them, you know, their thoughts. And then also swallowing is a big piece of it. We've all, you know, probably ordered swallow studies and whatnot. So the speech language pathology, pathologists complete those studies for us and help folks regain some swallowing ability. And then language and cognition is another piece of it that's really important. Um, probably a lesser known piece of this type of therapy is focusing on cognitive recovery, especially folks that have had some sort of brain injury, memory techniques and all that. And so why is this field of medicine important? Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons. Here's kind of a little flow chart so when folks have pain or anything else that limits their ability to be mobile, um, you develop weakness. You know, it's kind of a use it or lose it um, type of thing. Um, with weakness comes balance changes. With balance changes, of course, comes gait changes. And then of course, falls. Falls, um, and this would lead to decreased function and independence and that in turn leads to decreased quality of life in the vast majority of people. And this slide just goes through the consequences of immobility and um, why it's so important to keep our patients moving um, at all stages of life um, and stages of disease as much as we can. Um, with weakness, um, you lose 1.5% of muscle strength for every one day in the hospital. And this adds up to about 50% loss of muscle strength after five weeks of immobility. So certainly folks who have been hospitalized a long time in the ICU um, and that kind of thing are gonna have drastically reduced uh, muscle strength and function. Um, Obviously, DVTs, um, contractures, meaning that if you're not taking your extremities through their range of motion, they will get stuck <clears throat> in um, those positions due to fibrosis and um, muscle changes. Constipation, of course, um, pneumonia, atelectasis, heterotopic ossification. Um, this is where basically soft tissue um, literally transforms into bony tissue. And um, this has a lot of implications, including pain, um, again, contracture and decreased range of motion um, and skin problems. Um, infections will be more common if you are not moving. Hypercalcemia, osteopenia, mood is greatly affected. Um, just kind of aches and pains. Obviously sitting in a hospital bed is not comfortable, sleep disturbances and pressure wounds. There are a wide variety of subspecialties within the field of physical medicine and rehab. Um, I'm going to briefly describe some of them for you. Um, I believe there are six ECGME accredited fellowships for um, residents who pursue PM&R. So sports medicine is one of those. Um, this is of course gonna focus on the musculoskeletal system. Um, here you're gonna see some sports injuries. Um, these types of physiatrists may do sports coverage, might be a team, uh, a team physician and that sort of thing. They're focusing on joint, tendon, ligament, muscle um, issues, and they will do injections um, as needed to those sites, whether it be steroid injections, um, synvisc or 
cartilage uh, mimicking gel injections and um, other procedures such as the 10x procedure, which involves a little bit of hydro dissection of the tendons um, in a, an attempt to remove some scar tissue and decrease inflammation, bracing um, after injuries, and then also rehab for um, overuse injuries or um, folks who have had a degenerative change, um, usually at the joint. Pediatrics um, is another subspecialty of PM&R. Um, these physicians focus on children who um, maybe have a congenital abnormality, such as cerebral palsy, spina bifida. Um, they can see basically any developmental delays. Um, and then also acute injuries, children who are hospitalized after um, well, a lot of times after a terrible, <laughs> terrible injury, um, whether it be a car accident, um, smoke inhalation, brain injuries, um, near drownings, um, that kind of stuff. So pretty heavy duty things. And a lot of times you'll see a um, concurrent um, consult to PEDS palliative care. Um, so they work closely with um, PEDS palliative docs <clears throat> when determining things like prognosticating and um, determining the potential for recovery and rehab. So it's kind of that world. Um, another piece of PM&R is orthotics and prosthetics. Um, this is not necessarily a, um, a fellowship, but basically we all kind of get trained on um, different devices. For amputees, um, whether it be an amputation at the foot, the ankle, below knee, above knee, um, pelvis even, um, and then of course upper extremity amputees as well. Um, we assist with um, the prescription for the prosthetic and work with the prosthetist on coming up with the best plan for the patient and take them through their rehab course, take them through um, basically learning how to walk with these devices. Um, also um, orthotics, such as the um, carbon fiber AFO you see there for folks who have um, drop foot or spasticity or weakness and need um, their extremities to have some sort of bracing. And then we also focus on gait aids from your um, two-wheeled walker, rollator walker, to uh, different types of canes, um, hemi walkers, Parkinson's, um, U-step walkers, all that kind of stuff, um, giving folks prescriptions for those. Um, another field of PM&R is spine or interventional pain. And so this field um, has some crossover with our anesthesia colleagues. Um, so you'll see um, anesthesia residents and PM&R residents pursuing this subspecialty. These folks can help you with patients who have, um, you know, sites of pain that can be managed with a procedure or a block. This might include an epidural steroid injection, um, a facet um, steroid injection, um, other kinds of um, pain procedures such as a tap or a celiac plexus block. Um, and these can be very helpful for folks to target their um, sites of pain. Another field is electrodiagnostics. So um, basically, in, we're using a tool here um, called uh, nerve conduction studies and EMG. Um, nerve conduction studies, as you can see in the photo here, use um, small electrodes um, going uh, over the surface anatomy where the nerves run and then stimulating those sites, looking at the waveforms on a computer and um, basically comparing them to see uh, if they're within normal ranges. So this tells us about peripheral nerves. So these, these tests um, evaluate peripheral nerve injuries. And then the EMG portion of the study is where they take a small needle in a couple different muscle groups um, and listen to the activity on the computer 
and watch the waveforms. And this study tells us a lot about the connection of the nerve to the muscles. So this helps us um, diagnose or rule out conditions such as a radiculopathy, which is a pinched nerve coming from the spine, carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar neuropathies, other peripheral neuropathies, um, other neuromuscular disorders, and it can be very um, helpful in diagnosing and prognosticating things like a radiation-induced um, plexopathy, um, chemo-induced peripheral neuropathies, um, surgery or compression or swelling-induced neuropathies as well, because this study gives us a lot of information about the severity of the nerve injury, as well as if the injury is due to axonal loss or um, myelin loss. Neuro rehab um, is a segment of PMNR focusing on any folks who've had a neurological injury, um, primarily a CNS um, related injury. This um, includes a lot of stroke recovery traumatic brain injury recovery, spinal cord injury patients, multiple sclerosis, um, patients with movement disorders. And a big piece of this um, field is spasticity management. As you can see in the picture below, you'll see um, a flexed elbow, a flexed wrist, fingers that are tight. Um, and this occurs after um, a CNS injury with an upper motor neuron injury. Um, and folks are basically having an involuntary um, contraction of their muscles. And um, this becomes a big problem in terms of function, in terms of comfort. There can be skin breakdown, um, issues with hygiene, issues with being able to get dressed. So um, we treat this with a variety of things, including oral medications and injections, um, primarily Botox injections to the muscles. Um, in the inpatient world, um, PMNR is very helpful in terms of helping determine the disposition of the patient. And you can kind of see here the spectrum of options all the way from inpatient rehab, which is an intense um, rehab program within the hospital subacute, um, LTAC, outpatient, meaning home, palliative rehab, and then of course, um, hospice. And so by consulting your um, friendly physiatrist, they may be able to help you determine the best um, discharge plan for the patient. And then a little um, blurb about inpatient rehab. Um, if you work in a hospital setting, you might be familiar with this. Um, there's usually like a floor of the hospital dedicated to this. Um, folks have to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy a day, so it is an intense program. Um, and the goal is to have these folks return home. Um, limitations though, um, you may wonder why your patient was um, denied, um, or as one of my neuro friends once said, um, deemed not worthy for inpatient rehab. And that might mean, um, you know, they just don't have the potential to tolerate the program. They may be getting some expensive disease-directed therapy that we cannot accommodate, or um, their treatment needs may not accommodate the schedule, such as if they have um, radiation treatments or other things that are um, taking a lot of time. This is um, just the FIM scores that we use to determine um, their level of function. And then again, um, PMNR includes a multidisciplinary team very similar to palliative care. Um, one of the important things about um, PMNR is um, prehab or um, basically optimizing one's function prior to receiving disease-directed therapy. And this has been shown in multiple studies to um, be extremely helpful. Um, in this study um, of a multimodal prehab program, the folks who um, did the program, which included PT, OT, um, speech, and um, behavioral um, health as well, actually had better 
um, function, meaning um, in this case, they did a six minute walk test, meaning that the folks were able to walk farther in six minutes after completing this program, even after undergoing their um, colorectal surgery. The folks who did not participate in the prehab program had um, a lower ability or uh, walked um, a, you know, less distance after um, their surgery. So they had a functional decline. I did not mean to do all that. <laughs> Um, aerobic exercise is so important in our cancer patients. Um, it prevents mortality even within cancer, and it obviously decreases the risk of cancer. And just a generalized activity recommendation. It's certainly not one size fits all, but this is um, what the American College of Sports Medicine has come up with. Um, so I think it's important to note that in physical medicine and rehab, we can be helpful for folks with serious illness. They often have concurrent musculoskeletal problems, which could have been worsened throughout the disease or treatment process, um, as, well, as well as normal degenerative changes that come um, with aging. We can treat these things um, with a number of um, options, trigger point injections, steroid injections, bracing, and uh, rehab prescriptions. Um, you know, rehab in a hospice unit, um, we always are under the um, limitations of, um, you know, of what, what we could offer in hospice in terms of PT and OT, but um, there are studies out there that show um, both a um, higher quality of life and a longer survival if folks have access um, to treatments from PT and OT for things like pain, dysphagia, edema, lymphedema, um, and spasticity. So um, basically, um, PMNR in palliative care bridges the gap between um, function and well being. We can help you determine the appropriate setting for the patient's care. Um, with survivorship increasing, um, it's important to note that a lot of folks come out of um, treatment with significant functional impairments, um, and we can be helpful in that way. Um, and so this is these are kind of my concluding points. Um, I think that when um, I uh, told my mentors um, in residency that I was going into hospice and palliative medicine. Many of them thought, um, you know, why would you do that? Isn't that the opposite of what we have been training you to do for the past four years? And um, in reality, there are so many more similarities than differences. Um, physiatrists focus on things that palliative providers are also focusing on as well with the goals of quality of life, function, family and social support, um, pain management, bowel and bladder management, um, skin issues. And again, we are always trained in a multidisciplinary team with our therapists, rehab psychologists, social workers and nurses, very similar to um, the palliative care approach. Um, so my practice, I do mainly neuro rehab. Um, I do a wheelchair clinic, which can be very helpful for um, uh, palliative folks um, who are having a functional decline and um, trying to basically bridge the gap between rehab and palliative care. And then I do work at Zilber Hospice as well. So the combination of um, physical medicine and rehab and palliative care is so important, um, highlighted here. I also feel like, um, you know, our worlds are converging. Uh, from the palliative care standpoint, again, we have so much more survivorship um, and longer, um, you know, longer life expectancies than we've had um, even, you know, just a couple of years ago with our folks with serious illness. And then with that, comes these functional issues similar to, um, you know, and also in the, in the PMNR world, 
We're seeing folks on our um, inpatient rehab unit and other rehab units who are sicker than we would have seen even a couple years ago. So I do think like the worlds are converging and it's important for all of us to be um, well-trained in both um, functional impairments and how we can optimize function and independence as well as reduction of symptoms um, and having um, an excellent uh, multidisciplinary team for our patients and their families. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, there were a couple of questions that popped up into the chat. Uh, and, and I think that you address the, the connection. <clears throat> uh, Kren was asking for more um, information between palliative care and, and uh, physiatry. And, and then Rachel had a question. She said, uh, can you elaborate about the wheelchair clinic, how it functions to assist mm -hmm. patients? Sure. Um, our wheelchair clinic is done um, at multiple um, Aurora sites, um, including St. Luke's, West Dallas, and Grafton. Um, and it's a multi-D clinic with myself, a therapist, a physical therapist, and an ATP, um, a wheelchair vendor specialist. Um, we see patients and their families um, and do an exam on them um, and determine the best wheelchair for them, whether it be a manual wheelchair or a power wheelchair. Then we provide um, the prescription for that and the order gets sent right away. So it's like a one and done kind of um, clinic. And then um, we put it through their insurance. So it, depending on the insurance, it's usually covered and um, their wheelchair is delivered to them within six to eight weeks. And if you um, have any you know, uh, needs for that, just place, like I said, the service to physiatry order. And you can just type in wheelchair clinic in the comments and we will um, get your patients scheduled. Steve, did you have a question? I saw you come off mute for a sec. Yeah, um, hi, Sarah. In hi. Uh, 2019, there was this New England Journal of Medicine piece called Rehabbed to Death. I don't know if you're familiar with that article, but it basically talks about the problem with um, you know, the cycle of going to the hospital, then subacute rehab facility, then back to hospital, basically a spin cycle and the lack of kind of goals of care discussions and rehab facilities. You know, obviously there's yeah. payment structures that make people go to rehab, um, but do you see any opportunities or are you optimistic about um, more attention to goals of care and rehab facilities? Yeah, that's a great point. I am familiar with the article. Um, so, you know, uh, there are some brand new articles coming out um, in next month in February in um, the Journal of, um, so the Journal of Palliative Care, um, as well as AAPMNR um, from a couple of friends of mine who are dually board certified in PMNR and palliative care. And um, we are really focusing on the um, training of residents in PMNR with, to have more palliative care skills um, in terms of the communication skills required to lead goals of care discussions on their own um, to, within a rehab facility. So many rehab facilities around the country are single standing or freestanding facilities. So they may not have the palliative care team support that you would have within a hospital setting. So it is gonna be very important to train um, the upcoming, the residents going forward um, with those communication skills. And so that is definitely an initiative going forward in programs around the country. That's a great question. Thank you. I've, so your, your slide talking about the amount of muscle loss that is lost every day in the hospital was pretty yeah. profound. Do you have a do you have a spiel that you give patients about how they can recover that or their potential to recover that or what that might look like? Well, uh, we kind of use just like a, as basic of an example as, you know, the amount of time that you were um, sort of down or the amount of time that you were immobile, it's going to take that amount of time and then some to recover the strength that was lost. Um, 
a lot of times folks are in uh, a rehab situation for months. Um, it's not uncommon to be in the acute rehab unit for four or five weeks, then go to a subacute rehab facility for a month or two, and then continue outpatient. Um, with my stroke patients, we basically tell them that they're the most function they're going to recover will be within the first six months. And then they can expect the majority of the rest of their recovery to be within the first 12 months. Um, so for most folks, we give them, you know, six to 12 months to get the majority of their recovery and their rehab. But we will see functional improvements up to about five years out. For most injuries, particularly brain injuries. Um, and I just kind of tell everyone, connecting it back to my um, great great aunt, um, her secret to life was basically um, do not remain um, sitting for more, do not remain seated for more than 30 minutes. So um, that's kind of something that we can all take with us. Um, make sure you're moving your body at least um, every 30 minutes in some way, shape, or form. Well, that's a that's a good lead in to it's it's uh, getting close to the end time yeah. <laughs> here. So, were there any other questions before we finish up? Just just one. This is Liddell. Uh, that the, the the slide about the different uh, hand injuries or you know with the pinched nerve and stuff. Now I'm kind of dealing with uh, a pinched nerve, and so I was wondering um, how. How do you determine, like, I still got a little numbness here. Mm -hmm. uh, still dealing with my doctor, but, you know, it, it's just this slight, right? You know, I can feel. And so I'm just wondering, uh, is it something that I can do besides the, you know, the, the stretching of the neck and stuff to get that feeling back? Or is it I mean, medication? I mean, what, what, how do you, how do you do this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so definitely, the, it's a multimodal approach. The stretches and the exercises given to you by the therapists at the neck are very important. Um, sometimes they'll do some traction on the neck to kind of help release that nerve. And then also injections can be helpful, like a cervical steroid injection, where um, a physician who's trained goes right to that nerve root coming out the spine and bathes the area with some steroid and lidocaine. Um, and then, of course, like your neuromodulator medications like gabapentin, Lyrica, that kind of stuff. Okay, well, that, then I guess I'm doing all I can do. It's just not coming <laughs> back fast enough for me. So I just, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I just thought I'd ask. Uh, yeah. I'm supposed to get the shot, but, you know, uh, my, my doctor ended up with COVID, almost died. Oh, so, no. Yeah, so. Uh, oh, my goodness. You know, just trying to wait for him to get well, but uh, uh, you know my pain yeah. management doctor. So I appreciate this. I mean, this was this was good. Thank yeah, you. you know, nerves nerve recovery takes a long time. We tell patients um, an inch a month. So when you think about the track your nerve is taking from your neck all the way to your hand, it's going to recover at the rate of about an inch a month. So it can be a long recovery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Just from a pinched nerve, deep hand. Just, uh, <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Really Thank appreciate you. your time and expertise. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Have Sarah. a good weekend. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care.